G'day everyone, my name's Brian and welcome to another Pulses podcast. With me today is Associate Professor Andrew Phillips. Hello Brian. And Professor Chris Ruth smith Hi Brian. And today we're going to be talking about the changing international world order. So you know, just a small topic today, we're not you know, talking about things that are changing the very nature of the international system that we study. Um, but for me, I always find this quite fascinating because I've lived my life in a unipolar world where America has been dominant. You know, I don't remember any sort of difference. And for my students, they don't remember what the world was like pre-September 11. So the fact that this is all now changing is something that um, I found really fascinating. So I thought we'd get you gentlemen along to sort of discuss what's happening in the world today. So when we look in the world today, we see Syria, we see Ukraine, we see the South China Sea, um, the battle for Mosul is happening as we record this podcast. So it kind of feels that everything is changing. So let's sort of get into sort of that. But before we go ahead, I thought it would just be a good idea to look at what's been happening beforehand. So we use terms like liberal world order and this sort of stuff, but what are we actually talking about? I'm happy to have a first crack at that, Brian. Um, I think when we're talking about the idea of a liberal world order, a number of distinctions that we need to observe. The first is that this is an order that historically is unusual because it is an order of sovereign states. Uh, if you look at the international order, uh, really up until the 1960s, empire rather than sovereign states was a key feature, not the key feature, but a key feature of international politics. So it's a world of sovereign states, it's also one that is importantly, simply by its label, a liberal international order. What this means is that the order building project has been very much built around, um, I would say, at least three pillars. First of these is a faith in the effectiveness of international institutions and particularly international law as a means of peacefully mitigating or resolving international disputes. Second is a commitment to democracy and to the promotion of democratic norms around an ideal of national self-determination. And the third, and this is no surprise because this is an order that has had the United States as its chief sponsor, uh, this is an order that is also fixated with the idea of promoting global economic integration and with a faith in the pacifying effect of international commerce. So I think those three pillars, if you like, uh, international law, democracy promotion and the promotion of global market capitalism are the three features that are constitutive of a liberal world order that is also organised around a system of sovereign states. So, Chris, has it been successful at all? So, uh, look, Brian, I think it has been immensely successful, um, but I think I'd draw to, to, to add two things to what Andrew said about the features of the order. And people often describe the liberal international order as one of its characteristics is its institutions are open and rule-based, that's the language that John Eichen reuses. And that means that the institutions are open in the sense that states of all different cultural backgrounds, wealth, strength can participate in those institutions, often in most cases as equal members, um, and that they participate in those institutions on the basis of a common set of rules that shape their behaviour. Now that's a, both of those things point to um, a very proceduralist notion of the international order. So there's a set of institutional structures and actors pursue their interests within those structures. It doesn't really matter what those interests are, but the institutions regulate them. But there's another important side to the liberal international order and that has to do with its substantive values. And this touches most closely on Andrew's comments about democracy promotion. That liberalism isn't just about the institutional framework in which actors operate, but it's also about a set of, of values that privilege the rights of individuals. So it's very much an individualist kind of framework, and so we see in the liberal international order uh, a, a substantive normative framework that privileges things like human rights and protections of those rights, which adds another layer to the international order in addition to what Andrew is talking about. Now, having said all of that, I think that there are many things that the liberal international order can chalk up to its credit. And the first one would be declining interstate violence. For a range of different reasons, we've gone from a situation where 
at the end of this, after a century, virtually a century of conflict, uh, ending with the Second World War, we've gone from a situation where interstate warfare has become almost non-existent. Uh, now, that, to get that in historical perspective, um, when the United Nations was formed, there were, my memory is, 52 original members of the UN in 45. There are now 193, so nearly four times as many sovereign states. Now, that means that the number of sovereign states and the number of potential sources of conflict over territory, over interests, have multiplied. Historically, you would have said, that's got to lead to an increase in warfare. But actually, we've seen a decrease in warfare despite the increase in the number of potential sources of that. That's a major achievement, huge achievement. Second achievement is, uh, is economic development. We can all, uh, I think, identify the continuing uh, problems with the world economy, uh, unequal distributions of wealth, unequal terms of trade, all sorts of, you know, we can, we can talk about that. But the liberal international order and its economic arrangements have reduced the number of people living in absolute poverty on the globe dramatically. Uh, and that is not a, an insignificant achievement. Um, I think the third thing is the institutionalisation of, of human rights principles and those themselves have then had uh, quite a dramatic uh, effect on how uh, individuals who are persecuted are able to mobilise their claims and seek redress, often through very difficult protracted circumstances, but I think that's an achievement as well. Yeah, so we've looked at where we're at, so um, the sort of what was the liberal world order, some of its key benefits, and there have been quite a few. But when we look in the international order today, things are potentially, I'll use the word potentially, sort of shifting. So, Andrew, what's sort of changing in the international system as we see it today? Mm -hmm. I think there is, if we were to characterise the international system today and contrast it, say, with the apex of liberal triumphalism in the immediate post-Cold War period, where the United States is there as the unipolar power and is in a position of unprecedented freedom to be able to project and institutionalise its conception of the world. So this is not that long ago, 20, 25 years ago. I think what's changed since that time is that there has been a diffusion of power in the international system. There's been a diffusion of power horizontally to other sovereign states and there's been a diffusion of power vertically from states to non-state actors. Now, if we look at both of these patterns of power being spread throughout a larger number of actors, um, both of these were anticipated in broad terms. You can go back to Charles Krauthammer, if you must. Uh, some of my <laughs> students have been reading Krauthammer this week. Um, even someone as hawkish and neoconservative as Krauthammer as early as 1990 is anticipating that eventually the unipolar moment will end and that more states, more great powers will emerge in the international system. Now it's obviously most pronounced, most visible at the moment in East Asia. You've got the rise in China of an actor that is challenging the liberal international order across multiple fronts. First in terms of the sheer military and economic capabilities that it possesses. Um, to give you a sense of how quickly this transition is happening, in March 1996, Taiwan Straits crisis had occurred at that time. Chinese government was trying to intimidate the Taiwanese through very aggressive missile tests. The United States is able to deploy the Seventh Fleet in the Taiwan Straits and to do so in a way that successfully pushed China to back down. That would not be possible in the contemporary environment. China has worked very carefully to develop anti-access area denial capabilities to limit the space of effective American power projection in East Asia. But that power shift, and it's not merely pronounced in China, you see it also elsewhere in the international system. Significant, I said China was challenging the system in two ways. First at the material level, but second at the ideological level. Look, China proves that a model of authoritarian capitalism, at least to date, can potentially survive and thrive in a liberal international order without converging towards a liberal pattern. So that's the first set of changes, the horizontal redistribution of power to multiple poles in the international system. Now that's not an especially, it's a particularly distinct and important shift, but it's not, not, not especially unforeseeable. This is something that any good realist would anticipate. 
The second and potentially more destabilising shift, though, is the selective empowerment of non-state actors in the international system. So you announced at the top of the podcast that we are observing at the moment uh, the, the battle to retake Mosul in Iraq, away from the Islamic State. Uh, I think the Islamic State best exemplifies a shift in the international system, a vertical redistribution of power to non-state actors. We have always had violent non-state actors in the international system, but what is distinct now is that they are globally networked actors. Um, we will see very shortly, the Islamic State has lost Dabiq this week, a uh, key uh, territory for them. It will eventually lose Mosul. Uh, within the year, we'll see the Islamic State revert to a post-territorial phase of its configuration. But what's distinctive about the international system now is that you don't necessarily need to possess territory to conform to a state-like model in order to represent a very significant challenge. So I'd suggest that those are the two macro shifts that are currently reshaping world politics. On an ideological level, are we actually seeing a big shift in the international system or is it just realigning where the power distributions are at? Well, I think actually at the ideological level, it's, it's harder to see, I think. So what I think we can see is that um, we can see that there are some challenges to or attenuation of commitment to the kind of core values undergirding the liberal international order. So you'll find that uh, there is more dispute perhaps around questions of human rights there is more dispute around issues of inter the rule of international law. Um, I still see those as relatively marginal in the story. I think what's more interesting here has to do with the question of whether any attenuation on that front or any erosion is matched by any coherent alternative visions of what an international order would be. So, in the context of, you know, if we think back, so if we jump back to the, to the late 19th century, where, where the former order that was an order that was built around absolutist states in Europe, uh, built around particular kind of institutions, particular type kind of international law, is being displaced by the, liberal, the beginnings of the liberal international order. There were not just practices that were recognisably liberal, but there were also entrepreneurial states that had a vision for the international order that was liberal. And that, and, and through a series of kind of big order building moments after the First World War, after the Second World War, those ideas gradually took form into concrete institutional practices. Now what I don't see at the moment, and I don't see it coming from China, is any any, not just any coherent or developed, but any vision of what a post-liberal international order would look like. And that suggests to me, along with China's continued very strong engagement in a whole range of liberal institutions, even while it's gnawing away at others in particular contexts, I, I still think that the liberal international order is going to continue to provide the framework of the international order and will be sort of revised around the edges until we see some coherent alternative. Can I speak to that as well? I think that what's characteristic about the system at the moment, and I agree with Chris, there, there is no equivalent in the system at the moment of the Soviet Union at the height of the Cold War, mm -hmm. a country that is actively proselytising and investing serious ideological material effort to try to overturn the existing international system. So we don't have a powerful revolutionary state in the international system, the way that we have seen at different points in history. What I would suggest though is that I think that at least my sense is that there is a renewed period of ideological contestation and to simplify radically I think that falls along two distinct but sometimes overlapping lines. Uh, the first, and it relates to Chris's observation earlier, characteristic about the liberal international order is its presumed openness. It's a global vision, it's committed to the idea of international, particularly economic integration, as being necessarily a good thing, as being a pacifying force. I think we're seeing a significant retreat from that commitment to openness 
in both a uh, number of authoritarian challenges to the system. I think Putin's Russia provides the most powerful exemplar of that. Uh, but also within the West itself. Now, there is a typical tendency in the literature to conflate the liberal international order with the Western international order. Uh, and I think that overstates Western ownership and authorship of that system to begin with. I mean, Chris wrote a terrific book on the evolution of human rights in the international system and how it was actually African and Asian countries that had a very important role in that. But I, I think part of the problem also of conflating liberal international order and Western international order, some of the most profound uh, ideological adversaries to the current order can be found in Western states themselves. Mm. You know, and this is this cross-national nativist reaction which is embodied most dramatically in Trump, but we see it also in the Brexit movement, close to home, the Hansonite phenomenon as well. So I think it's a key line of ideological contestation. The second one that I'll just briefly uh, advert to is uh, a renewed contest over secularism versus piety as a key point of contestation within the international system. Now, obviously, the Islamic State represents the most toxic and violent expression of that. But this is a phenomenon that we see throughout the international system across multiple faith traditions. So what we're not seeing is a return to a titanic clash between status quo states on the one hand versus revolutionary revisionist states on the other. What we are seeing, though, is significant ideological contestation across the fault lines of openness versus closure and secularism, post-religious versus uh, pietist religious visions of the world. So because this is such a wide-ranging topic, I thought I'd ask some of my students some questions that I could put to you. So the first um, batch of questions come from Otis and Hamza, and they're talking about the BRICS countries. So that's Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, this sort of block of non-Western power in the international system. So are these BRIC countries actually a challenge to the evolving international order, or are they sort of really just working within the traditional system? I think you need to. I think you need to disaggregate the BRICS. I, can't, I think you can't generalise about them as a group. I think, uh, in many respects, uh, you know, if you look at the activities of those states in general, and you look at the areas where they're you know, where they're pushing hardest against the norms of the liberal international order, it's in, two, it's in two areas. One is it's in the area of the norms of global economic governance. Uh, and I think the, way, the areas where they're pushing there are, are entirely consistent with simple revisions to those norms, not, a, not an overturning of the liberal international order. In fact, to the extent that they are rising, they're rising as beneficiaries of that order. Um, the second thing is that you can see that they're pushing back a little bit at areas where there is an attempt to deepen the liberal international order, and that's around issues to do with responsibility to protect, principally. Where sovereign, the, the old areas of sovereignty, which has been their long-standing concern, they, you know, these states have been among the most robust defenders of the principle of sovereignty, it's not surprising that in those areas they should be pushing back. But again, not to, not to be totally opposed to something like responsibility to protect, but to revising the question, the nature of the norms and the rules that are around that. I think then if you, but if then if you move away from the generalisation and disaggregate it, I think there you find two states that in various ways are pushing harder against the order, and that's China and Russia. Uh, and perhaps it's not surprising that, that they're also the two geopolitically most powerful of those, of those states. I think in both cases, uh, there are very interesting challenges that are being posed to things like issues to do with uh, the rule of law, issues of territoriality, uh, issues of the laws of war in the case of Russia. Um, and you can see real pressure there in those cases. But again, I think those, are, those pressures are entirely within the scope of being manageable within the order. And if you look back over the history of the liberal international order, it's had to deal with such things in the past, so I think that's that's not not a um, uh, that's not a problem. Um, but what I but I, what I would say is that I, I would one of the issues to do with the rising has to do with in almost all of these cases, these are states that are built on profoundly weak domestic political structures. Uh, with almost without exception, every one of those states. Actually, interestingly, the exception would be India. Uh, are states that have um, 
had very, very problematic relationships between the state and society, uh, and where the maintenance of domestic legitimacy and rule is in fact the principal challenge of those states. And so I, and I actually think if you, if you want to think about the future role of those states in the order, it's not going to be a rising, it's going to be a question of the stability of these states in that order and the impact that domestic ructions are going to have on external behaviour. Yep, so we do see that sort of thing. So in Brazil, we're having the fight over the Petrochemical oil company and the falling of presidents. Um, Russia's political system is very terse with uh, oil-based economy and oil's quite cheap at the moment. Um, there's a potential housing bubble in China um, and all sorts of issues. So do these... Um, potential challenges actually have a long-term sustainability or are we seeing that sort of contestation start to unravel with because of their own sort of domestic issues? Well I think that collectively, keep in mind also, and it speaks to Chris's point, the BRICS category is one that was initially come up with by a consultancy company that was looking at explicitly as a category for trying to lump in large emerging market economies. So it was very much fixated. It, this was coming from the heartland of the liberal international order itself. Um, you don't get organisations more committed than international consultancies out of it. So as a category, it's not especially useful apart from identifying countries that are sufficiently large in their strategic heft to make a potential difference. But also, and I think Chris is, is right to, collect, to, to, to note this, these countries are fragile giants. These countries have deep-rooted problems of domestic stability and the risk as a result is that there will be an effort to externalise a lot of the legitimacy problems by pushing it onto the international system itself. So I think the real question is not one of the particular sustainability of any of these challenges but rather to say if we're looking at the, the BRICS category, first how analytically useful is it and I would suggest a significant degree of caution on that. But second, what are the long-term strategic options that these countries necessarily have and that they're likely to pursue. And I think just to itemise them very quickly, um, one option is continued passive integration into the international system. Uh, now this is likely to be unattractive because the reality is the larger you get, the more of strategic influence that you could potentially have, the more likely that you are to say, well, I'd like to rewrite the rules in a way that increasingly reflects my own interests and dispositions. So I think passive integration for countries like this is probably a non-starter. The second option, which I think is equally unattractive, is to try to insulate yourself from that order and say, well, we'll reject it and we'll adopt a strategy of autarky, essentially, of completely withdrawing from that order. Um, now, this is not an absurd possibility. You know, India, for its, from 1947 to 1991, embraced uh, import substitution industrialisation. We really didn't want a great deal to do with the global economy. Um, that has proved as a developmental model to be, to be unsustainable. So if passive integration and um, passive insulation, if you like, protecting yourself from the world order are not viable as options, then you've got to look at the alternatives. One would be to try to overthrow the order. Uh, no country, even China itself, has the capability of doing it. And this is where I do agree with those that look to the influence of nuclear weapons in international politics. Great power war, system challenging war of the kind that we saw in the 1930s and 1940s is difficult uh, to imagine, let alone successfully execute in the contemporary period. So what I think that we'll see is not an effort at hegemonic displacement so much as customised efforts at hegemonic substitution of saying, well, we can provide certain of the collective goods and services that the current hegemon provides, but we can do it in ways that are better, that are potentially more attractive to smaller states that are sitting on the fence. And the classic model of this at the, at, at the moment at the, that we see is the Asian Infrastructure and Investment Bank. So it's clearly an effort on the part of China to say, well, you're asking for us to be a responsible stakeholder. You're not providing us with voice opportunities commensurate with our power in existing institutions. So we're going to build alternative institutions. And the real challenge then, I think, in the international system as it's evolving is how do we make sure that these efforts at hegemonic substitution don't lead to growing incoherence and inter-systemic competition as those efforts mature. So I think that's the real danger rather than any threat of systemic conflict. 
Yeah, thank you, Andrew. Now, um, George has a question, and I think it leads on from that quite nicely. Um, America, the United States of America, has traditionally seen itself as the you know, global policeman in the international system. That's one of the sort of excuses they use for not signing up to the Rome Statute in the um, international court system. But as the 2000s have gone on, that's become less and less um, tangible um, in the international system, both from a d domestic capability and from the international s system going, um, maybe we don't want that. So if the US is no longer going to play the role of the global policeman, who would you rather take up the baton or should another state take up the baton? So I, th I think really the essence of this question, I think this question in some, some respects needs to be reframed. Okay, because as soon as you talk about global policemen, you're talking about an actor that can walk around with a stick and smack actors that step out of line or use the stick to pursue particular objectives that it or other members of the international order might wish to, wish to pursue. I'm not at all sure that the international system has ever rested solely on the existence of such an actor. Uh, for much of the Cold, for the Cold War period, in, in fact, stability of the system rested on something else, which of course was the balance of power between the superpowers and a series of institutional arrangements that codified that. If we go back to the 19th century, it was a multipolar system that in fact order was sustained by a deliberate policy of basing institutionalised policy of the balancing of power. The idea that, I think that the idea of the, of the policeman, right, is is an idea that historically we don't find even in the, even when the U.S. was at the height of its role as a hegemon, you know the use of it, its role as a policeman, which would be probably the, the, the its role in interventions, okay, were in two categories: either highly controversial, where the world wasn't sure that it wanted it at all, and probably produced negative consequences, Iraq being the main one. Or areas where there's pretty well you know, universal, universal agreement that we needed the US to intervene, Rwanda being the case, or earlier in Bosnia. So we're caught in two situations here. So I'd say, first of all, it's not been as important as people think it is. Second, it's been a mixed story when it has been expressed. Right? Uh, and so I don't, I don't think the world is quite as reliant and I wouldn't be rushing to say in the absence of the US we need a policeman, this should be the state. So we're coming to the end of our discussion and I thought um, seeing as we're talking about the future it might be a good idea just to see you know where we all sit, you know when you look at the future of the international system are you optimistic about where it's going, pessimistic? A bit meh in the middle. So where do you sort of put yourself? Okay. Well, but by, by, by definition, I'm I'm tend to be an optimist. So I don't think the liberal international order is going away anytime soon. I actually see the bigger issues for the liberal international order to do with the limits on necessary elaboration. So there are a whole series of areas that we currently need new institutional arrangements to deal with key problems from global climate change to managing the world economy, arms control in key areas. These are all areas where the old institutions are getting a bit tired. Right? They haven't collapsed. They're not totally useless, but they're getting a bit tired. They need, re new, or, you know, they need to take new form to be renovated. And what I see as being the biggest problem at the moment is the kind of lack of will and leadership to do that augmentation. So I think the most likely outcome for the next 20 years is in fact a liberal international order that kind of putters along and adapts when the pressure points become strongest, but where you don't get the kind of ambitious institutional construction that would be needed to deal with the many problems that we're facing. Yeah, I'm just for the sake of argument, I'm gonna take the pessimistic view of the international <laughs> order, and also it's probably closer to my personal disposition. <laughs> so I'll just put that on the table as well. Uh, the concern I have with the liberal international order is that historically it's been very top-heavy. 
in terms of being uh, a transatlantic as much as global order and one that has disproportionately privileged the interests of the West. Now, there's nothing that's particularly insightful or surprising about that. Uh, international orders tend to reflect the interests and values of their principal authors. But if I look at where the international order is heading at the moment, there are two concerns that I have. Uh, the first of those is the concern of leadership and whether or not there is the appetite in the West to continue to mount a sustained defence of the liberal international order and equally whether or not there is a willingness and capability on the part of rising powers to take up the baton of leadership in the event that Western leadership fails. So, for example, I think the reason that the election in the United States at the moment is so important, um, clearly uh, candidate Trump is a poster child for embodying many of the values that are antithetical to a liberal international order, but the success of his candidacy to date is reflective of a deeper popular disaffection in parts of the West towards sustaining an open global order. So I think that's problematic, is there's potentially an approaching deficit of leadership in the West uh, at a time when, precisely because of the issues that Chris raised in terms of the fragility of many of the rising giants, there may not necessarily be an appetite on the part of those powers to take up the baton of leadership. So that's, I think, the first threat, is that there could be a potential leadership deficit in the immediate future. I think the second issue is, uh, and this is where I'll close, is the risk of exotic destabilising threats undermining the entire fabric of the systems that's currently constituted. Now, Donald Rumsfeld once notoriously talked about the known unknowns versus the unknown unknowns, which is casting the minds back to 2003. I think we've got known unknowns that a system destabilises. One of those is anthropogenic climate change. We know it is going to be a very significant problem. We know that the ecological basis of the liberal international order has to date rested on a carbon intensive economy that will rapidly outstrip the planetary capacities to sustain that. Um, so that's a known unknown of how disruptive the consequences of climate change are going to be, how quickly they are likely to take effect, and whether or not our adaptive capacity to develop, for example, the clean energy technologies necessary to deal with that, will be able to keep up with or outpace those disruptions. Then there are the unknown unknowns, which uh, typically are cast almost in the language of science fiction, but I think that as strategists and in, in people engaged with the question of international order, we need to take seriously. I think potentially one of the greatest disruptors at the moment, um, and this is where I'm openly speculating in terms of its potential strategic effects, is for example the effect of uh, the increasing automation of manufacturing and the rise of artificial intelligence capabilities. Now it's very difficult to, to speak about this in any serious way without people evoking the spectre of the Terminator movies, of the rise of malevolent forms of artificial intelligence. I don't think we need to be as fantastic as that. I think that we need to think about, for example, let's say that rapid automation occurs in the manufacturing sector. The Liberal International Order has been based, to date, on a global model of organising economic production in which labour-intensive manufacturing is placed increasingly in developing countries and that is their pathway to prosperity, is to work their way up the value chain. Well, what happens in an international order when that pathway to prosperity has been eliminated due to disruptive, radical technological change? So I think if we're thinking about international order, then the leadership deficit is an issue that I worry about. There's the known unknown of systemic disruptors like anthropogenic climate change. And then there are the more exotic threats that may or may not be dominating these debates in years to come. So, on that note of the Terminator films, that seems like a good point to end it. So That I'd... was for you, Brian. I know that you like <laughs> pop culture references, so I'm deliberately catering to the moderator. Uh, Thank you very much. So, firstly, I'd like to thank uh, my speakers here, Chris and Andrew. Thank you very much for coming along. I'd like yeah. to thank the people who supplied the questions, and I'd like to thank you for listening. And so, see, till we see you next time for another Pulse of the Podcast, have a nice day. Clearly, more attention and more thought should have been given to the, to the post-conflict um, scenario. But the other thing to bear in mind with the Libya case is it all happened really very quickly. You know, prior to the crisis in March 2011, Libya was on nobody's watch list. It was not considered a fragile state. It was not considered um, um, a high risk of atrocities. So people were making things up on the hoof very quickly.